So we're talking about integrating renewable energy into buildings. Very dry title, I know. And um, I know that photo has a bright blue sky in it, which isn't really appropriate to the Scottish context. But basically finding uh, photos of renewables with grey clouds behind them is pretty difficult. So my name's Ran Boydell. I'm a registered architect in Australia, but currently living and working here in the Scottish borders. Um, I also do some teaching at Edinburgh and Harrow universities, and I, I'd like to think that I'm a pioneer of sustainable homes. That's really my, my key focus. And anybody welcome to get in touch with me about any of those issues. So what is renewable energy? In very simple terms, it's about harnessing natural energy sources. Um, but it also includes what we might call regenerative sources, so trees and plants, and they are considered sustainable on the basis that they regrow, uh, and so they're a continuing resource, and they capture the carbon back out of the atmosphere and the growth. Some of the technologies we talk about as renewables aren't really renewable in that sense. They're more about energy efficiency. So something like a heat pump is about upgrading the energy output from the electricity you use. Or heat recovery is about capturing waste energy and batteries is about balancing your supply and demand. And a term that's often used is the coefficient of performance of a COP, which is the relevant amount of energy you get out versus what you put in. So why use renewable energy? Primary source is about reducing carbon emissions and we won't go on to the details of that and climate change, etc. Um, but also if they're appropriately installed and size, they'll reduce your energy bill. There is actually an ongoing cost saving in renewable energy. If you've got an off-grid location, it might well be cheaper for you to put in a standalone system than it will be to connect to the grid. But even if you are on the grid, they can add to your resilience and your self-sufficiency uh, in your energy supply. So they'll give you some resilience through blackouts and power outages, that sort of thing. Why integrate renewable energy into buildings? Buildings account for about 40% of total global energy use. So it's a huge proportion of the energy that we use. And to try and reduce carbon emissions, both government and the market are offering incentives to, to do that. You also get uh, carrots and sticks from planning and building regulations. So when you do your SAP or EPC calculations for a building warrant, um, you get extra brownie points by having renewable energy in the mix. You can also get efficiencies when your demand and supply are linked, and if appropriately installed, it'll allow for future changes in technology. You know, this field is constantly emerging, and what's, what's um, best practice now will be redundant in a few years' time. It's important to emphasise that the, the imperative is to first reduce your energy demand through insulation and air tightness, and in doing that, you will also reduce the size of the system that you need. And a final note, already... Uh, we see that UK governments have banned gas boilers going into new built homes from 2024-25, so just a few years away. Just last night, um, the UK government announced their Green Recovery Plan, which uh, builds on uh, items already released by the Scottish government. Um, one of the headlines last night was apparently we're going to be installing 600,000 heat pumps a year by 2028. Um, I think it's pretty dubious that figure will ever be reached. But the, the point remains, this is, this is not just twiddling around the edges. This is a huge scale in the transformation we are facing. So the types of renewable energy, I look at that in terms of electricity and then heat. And we'll also look at heat recovery, energy storage systems and shared systems. And all of this comes in the classification of what's called micro renewables. So there's anything below 50 kilowatts in capacity. Um, beyond that, there's a whole different regime. First on electricity, you've got three options, solar PV, wind turbines, or hydro schemes. Um, in terms of building integration, wind turbines and hydro um, aren't generally an issue. They might be on isolated sites. Um, so we won't talk further about those tonight. We'll look mostly at solar PV. So a standard panel is about one by 1.7 meters in size. And the average output at the moment is 300 watts, 0.3 of a kilowatt. And that has improved radically. Um, when they were first in common usage 10 years ago, it might have only been 200 watts a panel or 180 watts a panel. And the very best performance you can get now is 350, 380 watts per panel. 
And the point about this is for a standard single phase connection, the most that the power companies will let you install is four kilowatts for the phase. So that equates to about 13 panels. If you've got three phase connection, you can get up to 12 kilowatts, that's about 40 panels. However, if you look at a typical new build, they'll probably only have something like three or six panels on the roof. So that's only using one or two kilowatts. So, so they're not even using the capacity they could for a single phase. And the other constraint on this is the inverter, which is the, the bit of kit that you need that goes between the, the panels and the, and the grid. Um, and they will have sizing constraints and that might limit, the, depending on the inverter you've installed, it might limit the number of panels you can add to your system. So typically panels are put up on, on surface mounted battens or frames. Um, and they're all very obvious up on the roof, they just go on top of your existing roof cladding. Um, however, more and more we're seeing integrated panels going where you emit the roof covering underneath um, to the extent that the whole roof uh, can be covered without any standard roof tiling on it at all. Um, interlocking roof tiles were also something coming to the market five or six years ago. Um, they haven't really made it big time over here. I think they're probably bigger in the States. Um, but for all of these things, from the contractor's point of view, you're working at heights. Um, and there are all sorts of issues, health and safety issues, of course, associated with that. And that's one benefit of having a, a standalone or ground array system. Uh, by standalone, you could put it on a, on a terrace or a, or a pergola, you know, some low level system. And that avoids you working at height. So jumping across to heat, we've got another three. We've got heat pumps, biomass boilers, and solar thermal. And uh, that's a pretty looking biomass boiler we've got in the middle there, but we'll, we'll look at some more rugged ones as well. Um, first, starting with heat source, because this is by far the most common um, sort of system coming in. A heat pump's really a fridge working backwards. That's all it is. It's, it's, it's old technology just being applied in a new way. And just as uh, a fridge has got the coils on the back of it as the heat transfer medium, um, so we need a source for the heat transfer, which for an air source means a, a fan, fan coil unit outside the building. For ground source, it means uh, a borehole drilled down or loops put into a, a, a trench about a metre deep. Um, or for water source, you can get it from any uh, surface water, river or lake, or you can get it from an underground aquifer. Um, for all of these uh, sources, they come into the same unit. And that unit can be just a wall mounted system, not very different in size to a, a current gas boiler just hung on the wall. Um, but a lot of the time they're an integrated unit, which is something about the size of a fridge. And that's got the hot water cylinder and all of the control integrated into it, which means the site installation uh, is much more straightforward. For biomass boilers, you've got, again, three different options. You've got pellets, which is a sort of chicken feed in, in, in size, but it, it's uh, sawdust effectively. And you can either get those in individual bags in bulk, which means you've got the option of manual or mechanical loading. Most homes, it would just be manual loading where you literally pour a bag into the top of the boiler. The example there is on a farm near Heriot. Um, it's just an external location. It shows you you don't need to have anything fancy about this. It doesn't have to be in a shed. It can just be on the side of the house, somewhere that you can readily integrate it into your um, central heating system. A log boiler, very different kettle of fish. This is where you put whole logs in, anything up to a metre long. Uh, you stack those logs in. Uh, there's a, a good example at Ruber's Law Campsite at Denham. Uh, where they have a big hot water accumulator and they fire it up once a day through the colder months of the year. The final form is a, is a chip boiler uh, and that is where you have big, big wood chips that go into some sort of a silo and bin. Um, you really need a significant size system for that and you need mechanical loading um, to load them into the bin. Um, if you've got an estate where you've got a lot of outbuildings you can link together in a district heating system, um, chip boilers are great ways to go if they've got their own uh, woodland on site where they can source the timber from, ship it straight into the system. Some farms and boilers also have straw burners. I know Ledgerwood Farm has their own grain dryer and they've got one where they literally just stack um, round straw bales into it, standard round straw bales in, and they burn from there. 
solar thermal, we think of this mostly for hot water, and you've got two different forms, the flat plate collector and the evacuated tube, which sounds terribly unpleasant, I always think, but they are much more efficient in their operation. And there are some coming on the market now which uh, don't include antifreeze and have other ways of operating that make them particularly suitable um, for a cold climate. And that's one of the misconceptions about thought solar thermal. It's not just for hot climates. Um, it does work in, in cool climates like we have here as well. Again, the hot water cylinder, you can either connect to your standard internal unit or you can have a roof mounted unit as you can see in that image. The other thing which isn't used often in the UK, but the solar hot air collectors, which can just be mounted on the side of a house and they effectively preheat the fresh air supply coming into the house. Heat recovery is another uh, thing that's becoming much more common and it's a way of capturing um, outgoing heat and transferring it to the incoming supply. For air, that's through a mechanical heat recovery ventilation system, which as you can see in the photo is, is basically just big box of tricks where you've got a series of ducts coming in from the house, typically from your laundry, kitchen and bathroom. So instead of having individual extract fans, you'll have a ducted system coming in. They capture the heat from that air and transfer that into fresh air supply coming in, which they'll pump back into those living rooms and bedrooms. Um, and for passive house, the, uh, the very energy efficient house standard, um, it's a mandatory item. The other sort of heat recovery is wastewater heat recovery. And you can see that really charming photo there of a, of a, of a very high quality installation um, but it's very simple. It's just taking the water that comes out of the shower or the bath. It's running it through a series of, of, of pipes where the heat is allowed to transfer into the incoming water supply. Um, and it's of most value there on a shower where you, the, the hot water is running out literally at the same time that your cold water is running in. Um, it's much easier to install in a new build uh, where it can be integrated into the system. It, doesn't achieve a lot in the overall terms of energy efficiency, but every little bit helps. And it does actually get you some extra brownie points for the SAP calculations uh, for a new build. Um, just a sideline in the borders, there is a commercial wastewater heat recovery system at the Borders College campus, where they capture the heat from the Scottish water sewer. So all the water coming through the sewer in Gallashields goes through that supply and they capture the waste heat from that which provides 100% of the heating to the college campus. In terms of energy storage, um, batteries, Tesla, there are other brands available. Um, what that means is that if you've got solar panels on the roof, instead of using maybe 30% of the electricity you generate, you might be able to use 80 or 90% of the energy you generate. So it's of much more value to you to use it yourself rather than selling it to the grid. And that's where batteries um, have real benefit. And again, their prices have plummeted uh, and are plummeting now. There are also heat batteries where you can store heat through phase change materials so they can be linked to other sorts of uh, renewable energy generation. Um, and on the bigger scale, there's what there's called thermal storage, which is effectively putting your heat pump into reverse so you're pumping heat back into the ground to store it up for the winter months. Um, and what that also means is you can get cooling in your interior using that same heat pump system. Very quickly on what I call shared schemes. So district heating, that's where you've got a central heat source and a series of flow and return pipes going out to individual buildings. All you need is a, is a very simple plate heat exchanger in each building to transfer the heat it then connects into your existing um, wet radiator system. Um, it's good for rural, rural building groups um, or where you've got mixed use development where you might have a mix of, of residential use as well as some commercial use. Um, great if you've got a heated swimming pool, something like that as well. One of the current buzzwords is distributed energy resource or DER, which is, might be a term you, you, you come across um, out there in the world um, really what that just means is instead of having a centralised energy source like we, we have had to date, that it's distributed around. Um, but you can have localised schemes out of that, so you can have a neighbourhood or community scheme. It's a good way of balancing loads. On a big development, it might mean that you can avoid having to um, augment the grid connection. 
because you can balance the loads within the site rather than having to go out to the grid. Um, and the bigger the scale it is, the more viable the storage options become. Instead of relying on things like Tesla batteries, there are other lower cost uh, forms of battery storage you can rely on. Um, and a final one is, is, a, is the roof lease option. Uh, there are lots of companies out there who will literally lease your roof and stick the solar panels on there. They're not so common now. It was more prevalent when the feeding towers were available, um, but the options are still there. And one of the other buzzwords is all electric, and that is to say that our energy system is rapidly becoming all electric. Um, and what that means for building energy use is that 100% of our uh, energy will be from electricity. And that's, for instance, you're using a heat pump rather than your gas boiler. But it's also because we're increasing our electrical use anyway. All the electronic and digital equipment that we use uh, actually increases electrical demand um, and electric vehicle charging will come into that as well. You've got to put all that in the context that the whole grid is going to become decarbonised. So whatever electricity we do use, whether it's from the grid or from our own system, by that 2050, it's all going to be zero carbon. It's all going to be renewable. The National Grid have said that they're going to have the grid ready for 100% renewable supply at any point in time by 2025. Um, and all of this reflects that electricity is, is the easiest energy source to work with. You can integrate it with smart systems and that sort of stuff. The only exception back to our heat, heating systems uh, is biomass. If you've got biomass resource readily available locally, um, or if you've got a district heat system that might use waste energy, um, that's where we're still going to have non-electric heat. So what's the scale we're talking about? We got the data from MCS, which is the UK certification agency for, for micro-renewables. And they very kindly sent us the data for all 78,000 installations that have been put into Scotland since 2012. And in assessing that, we realised that compared to the Scottish average, Tweeddale has twice the number of systems per population, three times the total uh, generation capacity, and going up to close to four times the carbon reduction that comes from that. And we think that's probably fairly typical of, of rural areas as opposed to urban areas. But nevertheless, we think that provides really strong encouragement for contractors in Tweeddale to know that demand already exists and that's only going to grow in the transition to, to zero carbon. Funding for that, um, well, there was the feed-in tariff regime. Now, that closed in March 2019, but most of the panels you'll see up on roofs now will be benefiting from the feed-in tariff, and that goes for a 20-year lifespan. So they get, they get money back from that over a long period of time. But what has come into place since the start of this year is what's called the Smart Export Guarantee, and that means that the energy companies have to pay you for any money, any energy that you sell to the grid. Um, it used to be they didn't have to pay you, you were just obliged to feed it out anyway. And that is now averaging about five and a half pence per kilowatt hour, whereas we might be paying 12 or 15 pence per kilowatt hour for energy that we buy. So it is a reasonable percentage um, of the supply versus demand. Um, in terms of heat, there's the renewable heat incentive for homes, that's going to close in March 2022, so there's still plenty of time to get systems in on that. The non-domestic scheme closes March next year, so that's pretty close. Um, and if a project hasn't been initiated already, you'd be struggling to get it in by that deadline for the non-domestic. In terms of Scottish Government, um, there's the Home Energy Scotland scheme that has a range of different grants and lower interest free loans, um, whether for vulnerable households and tenants or for private homeowners and landlords, and particularly private landlords, they are under obligations to increase the energy efficiency of their houses to get an EPC of C or better. Um, and so there will be um, the necessity for private landowners to upgrade their buildings. There's also something called the Energy Investment Fund, um, which provides funds to community and commercial projects, and that's ongoing at the moment. Um, of course, there are lots of other things coming through. Um, the Green Recovery Grants are likely to result in other sorts of funding being available. So a case study. We picked this on, out from the MCS data that we got. So this is a, a new build in the Tweeddale 
area that was done five years ago now. And it's got three different technologies on it. It's got a three kilowatt solar PV system. It's got a one and a half kilowatt solar thermal system. And it's got a 12 kilowatt ground source heat pump. Um, and they used the loops for that. So they've got 700 meters uh, of ground loops. Uh, you can see the estimated uh, costs for those systems if you were to install them today. Um, but also importantly for the solar thermal and the ground source heat pump, that's where the renewable heat incentive payments would come in. And for systems at that size, um, it, it, it varies depending on the sort of energy you're offsetting. There are lots of variables, but I did a quick calculation and it said I'd get 13 and a half thousand pounds paid over a seven year period. So you're getting back about half of the installation costs for those systems, um, which is uh, obviously a significant uh, benefit. And if you look at that, you look at where costs have gone over the last 10 years. So for a four kilowatt system, that's slightly bigger than the, the three kilowatt we saw there. Um, prices have effectively come down to 25% of what they were uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and then if you look at what that means for what uh, generation capacity we've got, you can see that again over the last 10 years, generation capacity has gone up fourfold across the UK. Um, and that brings to end. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you want more details about uh, the project and this network that we're establishing, best to contact Julie Knox on the details provided.